praying uh, for that. It was, it was great because especially as we are, were taking this time to talk about highlighting the home, uh, it was such a relevant message. If, you, if you're joining us for the first time or for the first time in a while, we've, we've had three weeks now of, of a, just, just emphasizing uh, the home. And we've talked about love. But first, we talked about covenant love and covenant love, how the love between a man and a woman, uh, when, they, when they get married, when the, uh, the, the covenant love that they offer to one another is meant to reflect the covenant love we as Christians receive from Christ. The second week, we went on to commanded love because uh, the whole idea is that in the law, Jesus said that the whole law can be summed up in two commands, but both of them have to do with love. Love God and love your neighbor as yourself. And if you were here these last couple weeks, you might remember this. We looked at the perfect environment of Eden where there was no sin, and we saw Adam not having to be commanded to love his wife. He freely offered his love to his wife. But then as we go to Ephesians, which we'll again do today, Eden, there's, there's love being offered. And in Ephesians, there's love being commanded. As Paul says four times in just a few short verses, husbands, love your wives. Like why, why do you have to be commanded in Ephesians? And why in Eden is it freely offered? And there's one word, sin, right? Sin really gets in the way. It's, it, sin doesn't stop us from loving that's not the point. Sin never stops us from loving. Sin, sin prioritizes us to love ourselves rather than God. Love ourselves most rather than our neighbor. Love ourselves at the cost of others. It's what sin causes us not to, not to stop loving, but to, to aim that love at us. But that's why Jesus came, right? Jesus came and in his death, his, his resurrection, his ascension, he, he offered freedom from sin. And since he offers freedom from sin, he offers the availability for us to love others and not have to love ourselves. But how does Jesus' death, burial, resurrection, how does that offer freedom to love others? Because he was sinless. And because Jesus was sinless, he offered us perfect, complete, and full. Hey, Philip, how are you doing, man? I didn't know you were back. So good to see you. Philip, back from the Marines. I'm saying, man, thank you. Thank you for serving our nation. Philip, I appreciate that, man. <laughs> Sitting behind the Coleman's, I'm surprised I see, I saw anybody, you know, back there. Uh, that whole row is way up there, but... Uh, so good to see you, man. <laughs> but because Jesus loved us with that perfect love, we don't have to love ourselves. Right? And that's where we as Christians, as we sang about just, just now, we sang about the goodness of God. We sang about the faithfulness of God. Why do we sing about those things? We remind ourselves of how good God is, how much God loved us, because then that frees us not to have to love ourselves. It frees us to offer that love to others as we have been commanded and so the love of jesus changes our week yeah we gather together on sundays to worship him but it changes our monday through saturday as well and that's what i want to talk a little bit about today is how the love of jesus impacts my home throughout the week and so in Genesis chapter number two, um, we're going to read about 10 verses here. We're going to start in verse 15 and read through the end of the chapter. And I'm going to ask you to really pay close attention to verse 18 when we get to verse 18. All right. But we're going to read a pretty lengthy passage just so we have the context. Verse number 15 says this. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man saying, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. Now notice verse 18. Then the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Verse 19. Now out of the ground, the Lord God had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. Verse 20. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to the every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. 
So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed, it up, closed up its place with flesh. And the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Verse 23. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. So we get this context of the creation narrative of, of woman being created. And, and in verse number 18, I want to draw your attention there because there's, there's a couple things I want to point out. First, it says that God says it is not good. Like up until this point in the creation narrative, every time God has paused to look at what he's done, he said, it is good. Now he says, it is not good. But second, we read that God says man is alone, but God had already formed all the animals, so he wasn't really alone. The animals were there. Plus, God was there. And so God looks at Adam, who God's presence is there, the animals are, are there, and he still says, this man's alone. But then also, he uses the word helper. He says, I'm going to make a helper fit for him. Now, the, the word helper is taken from this Hebrew word, excuse me, there, there we go. It's taken from this Hebrew word called izur. It's a, it's a Hebrew word, and to me, it's translated helper. At some point, some people will point at this verse of Genesis chapter 2, verse number 18, and they will use it to say, well, the man was created and the woman was created to be his helper, and they'll try to differentiate a value between man and woman. That woman was created to be a helper, so there's, there's a less significant or less value to a woman, and I have just cannot tell you how absolutely wrong that is, and I want to prove it to you. Because in, in Psalm chapter 121, David says this, my help, my is your, same word, comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So if what we're going to say is that the helper is not as significant as the one who is offering, who is being offered help, what, we're, what David is saying here is I'm more valuable than God. And we know that's not true. We see it again in Psalm 118, verse number seven. The Lord is on my side as my helper or my ezure. The King James would, would read, the Lord is with those who are my help. God is my helper. So no doubt the word ezure here, referencing the Lord and also referencing Eve is not trying to bring a value to who the helper is offering assistance to, not in that whatsoever, but it should draw our attention to the purpose of why Eve was created. So often when we think of husband and wife, we immediately think of intimacy. And, and it makes sense. I mean, it does say in, in, in Genesis 2.25 that they were naked and not ashamed. They're also given the, the, they're also given the command to be fruitful. And you, you can't be fruitful as a husband and wife without being intimate. So the intimacy is certainly there. But the, it's, not why the, it, it's not why Eve was created, according to the Lord, as being a helper. And so we see that, that marriage, this relationship, and we're not... We're not going to stay on marriage all day. I just want you to know that. But, but I want you to, to see this. Marriage offers a level of relationship that no other friendship offers. Right? She was meant to be a helper and easier to Adam, except she, as his wife, is also freed to enter this intimate relationship with her husband. It shows us those, that depth of marriage is founded on a friendship but it has the freedom to move into the restricted area of intimacy. And that restricted area of intimacy is important, and that's why marriage is restricted to, to a man and a wife. I love to hear when people say, I'm married to my best friend, because I think that's exactly what God wants. I love this person who is my best friend friend side to side but i love also the face-to-face -face intimacy with this same person that's a relationship you don't share with anyone else in the world and it's important because in, in proverbs 31 30 sorry in proverbs 31 30 the, the bible does say that beauty is fleeting <laughs> so we know if, if, if we have a marriage that is based simply on appearance we're in trouble if you give it a little bit of time 
as Lori so kindly mentioned to me this morning, oh, I saw these pictures of you and Jamie on Facebook and I like, I had to cover up the hair to see if I recognized you or not from those earlier days. Yeah, and probably the sides too because I know I wasn't that chubby either. And yeah, but you look in the mirror nowadays, well not you, but, but when I look in the mirror nowadays and I look back at pictures of what I was when I graduated uh, college at 160 degrees, 160 degrees, 160 pounds and, and, uh, and toned body and I think I'm really glad that my wife sees more than just the physical in me because she would be really disappointed. Uh, <laughs> But there's another verse that convinces me that the statement of it's not good for man to be alone goes far beyond marriage. In Proverbs 29, verse number 15, this was a verse that was used last week both in our baby dedication but also by Jeff Keaton. We read, a child left to himself alone brings shame to his mother. So so man was alone and that was not what God said. And a child left to himself or a child left alone, a child left undisciplined, that's not good because that child's going to bring shame to his mother. And so, hey, parents and grandparents and aunts and and uncles and, and family members, you are such important and crucial pieces to a child being raised to serve and to love and to follow God. You are. Because a child can't be left to himself. But also as a church family, hey, we're important. You, you are important to the other, to the children, to the teenagers in this room in helping their moms and dads raise children that will grow up to honor their moms and dads as the Bible would desire. As I look back across my life, there was no two greater influences in my life growing up than my mom and dad, but I didn't see it then. It was their daily faithfulness, presence, example that was making a difference. But to me, it was also this community of Sunday school teachers, coaches, teachers in my Christian school. My my own brothers had a huge impact in molding me into a man that desired to follow God. Even I remember one time my sister who was married and living up in Michigan, she came down and uh, stayed with my mom and dad while I was still living at home before I was married and she spent a weekend uh, with us and she went back home and she wrote me a letter and she shared a concern that she had for me with love and I, I, I don't have my knowledge but I remember my sister going home and saying Brian here is something in this weekend where I was with you that that there was a concern that I have and I want to lovingly express it to you. Hey, that's what it means when a child is not left to himself. There are, there's got to be people who enter into that child's love life with love and, and maybe God's calling some of you to do write a letter to someone that you want to lovingly express. And you say, well, I'm not even related to them. Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all times. A brother is born for adversity. You know, the word adversity actually comes from the root of evil or wickedness. A brother is is there for the time, maybe when our hearts want to stray. You know, it's so easy when we have someone who knows what to do is right to to just sometimes say, well, that's that's on them. And no, 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 a brother is born for the day when a heart may stray to pull back to the Lord when a friend is making bad decisions step into that whether you are brothers by human blood or whether you are brothers and sisters by divine blood step into those areas because it is not good for men to try to live their lives alone Proverbs 18 24 reminds us that one who has unreliable friends soon comes to ruin But there's a friend who sticks closer than a brother. This repetition is supposed to drive home the point. It is not good for any of us to go at life alone. And it's not good when we see someone attempting to go into life alone. We need one another. Yes, we need the Lord. Of course we need the Lord. But remember what he said about Adam. He was with Adam and said, it is not good for that man to be alone, even though my presence is him god knows we need human relationships and that's why i would love to encourage you as a church to be more than just a part of this big assembly once a week 
The, the life groups that we offer are meant to do more than just offer one more Bible study. They're meant to allow you to enter into relationships, caring for one another. For, for example, my, uh, my office is right across from Carolyn's room, which is where Gordon is having his life group. And, and, and they're on a series called Work is Worship. What you do with your life, your, call, your work is worship to God. And it was a couple, couple weeks ago, I was going into my office to get something and I heard J. Roy talking. And I love listening to Jay talk. God really blessed that man with, with incredible wisdom. But they were talking, actually, Jay and Caleb, um, talking about what, what we do with our work and whether there's worth to it. And, and I heard Caleb, who is a public defender, which means sometimes he is defending criminals, and sometimes those criminals are people that a guy like Jay working in law enforcement is bringing and it leaves them on opposite sides of a courtroom. And I remember Jay saying, no, no, but Caleb, you have to understand the worth that you bring to those people is that you are defending their human rights. That we can't bring an accusation against them, throw them into a jail. They deserve to be defended. Oh, that's, that's, Jay, Jay's such a kind man. I'm sure that encouraged Caleb a little bit. And I was gathering my stuff and about to walk out. And Jay said, hey, let me go back again. And let me talk to Caleb one more time. He said, you know what, Caleb? Do you know why our Savior was crucified? Because there was no one there to defend the rights of the innocent. What you're doing is what Jesus needed. And I was like, Whew. I don't know how you felt, Caleb. I felt really good for you. I felt like this guy's got to be walking out today feeling like my worth and my work it's important. And he heard that not from a, a preacher. He heard that from a friend who's, who's sitting in a circle to look face to face at him, to remind him of his value. And, and so to me, I would encourage you. We have Sunday morning life groups. We have weekday life groups. Find some way to gather with people where you can encourage and step into their lives. So it's clear that God did not make man to be alone. That's why he gives us marriage. That's why he gives us family. That's why he gives us friendships, right? But here's the question. Why is it not good for man to be alone? Why does he need an easier? Why does he need a helper? And this is where I want to jump right back to Ephesians chapter 5 with you. If you could go back to Ephesians. With this, I know this is about marriage, but we're going we're to make the principle go far beyond marriage. But beginning in verse number 25, in chapter 5, and verse number 25. And again, this is going to be familiar because we've read this the last couple of weeks as well. But Ephesians 5 says this, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now that's not new. We've read, we've read Christ's covenantal love. We read of our desire or our, our command to love here. But in these next few verses, here's what I would really love for you to pay attention to in these next few verses. I want you to notice what Christ's sacrificial covenantal love does to his bride. Okay? Okay. Watch what Christ's love does to his bride. Verse 26. That he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. So, so here's what I want to ask. Did you notice how the sacrificial love of Christ changes his bride, changes the church? And in great ways. The spiritual term for this, and I'm not trying to make this difficult for you to understand, the spiritual term is called sanctification. As, as we continue to grow more and more like Jesus because of the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, as we believe in the person of Jesus as Messiah and Lord, and as we believe in the work of Jesus as the atonement for our sins, we are justified. And that's salvation. That's a one-time moment. We are saved in a moment. And then for the rest of our life, we go through 
sanctification process that's what's behind me detailed in Ephesians chapter number five the sanctification and we're very thankful as Christians or we should be very thankful for this work in our lives because every one of us I think would admit we know we need continual cleansing we know we need the word of God to wash us we know we need the spirit of God to cleanse us we know we need the holiness of God to work deeper and deeper into our hearts and lives right we, we get that so then let me ask you a question if we expect the sacrificial love of Christ to transform us And if that's the same love that we are supposed to offer one another in our relationships, why do many refuse to change who they are in their marriages, in their families, and in their relationships? We expect change to come as Christians when the love of Christ hits us. But it seems as if there's this mentality sometimes in our relationships that I want you to love me the way Jesus loves me, but don't expect me to change. I am who I am. It's like, hey, you knew who I was when you married me. Don't expect me to change now. Could you imagine a Christian looking at Jesus and saying that? I want your sacrifice. I want your all-consuming love. I want you to die for me. Hey, but don't expect me to change. Don't expect me to, to live for you. Well, that's not at all what the word of God tells us. Right, what does Jesus say to the rich young ruler who comes to him? He wants eternal life. He falls at the feet of Jesus. He worships him. He calls him rabbi. So there's this deep respect that this man has for Jesus and he says I want eternal life and Jesus says, sure sure go sell all that you have give it to the poor and then come follow me and the man walks away very discouraged and, and it's because Jesus was going at his heart and Jesus was realizing you want me to give all of all that I have but you don't want to give me all that you have And that's the way many relationships work too. But see, for those who really understand what we sang about, that love of Christ, that all-consuming love of Christ that stops at nothing, that love that is running after us, you know, when we understand those depths, we begin to embrace a life of change. And, And what's so cool is as a church, we get to see it. You remember the second week of, of, of the first two weeks of, of January, we watched three baptisms, two, uh, a mom and a, and a daughter who were baptized. And then the next, next week, Tom League, who Tom, if you heard his testimony, Tom grew up Catholic and said, there's absolutely no way I'm ever going to get baptized in a Baptist church. Second week of January, that's exactly what happened. How? The love of Christ began to transform him. A couple of weeks ago, we had a Lynn, Miss Lynn Schwartzlander has a love for students uh, around here, and, and, and especially the ones that she knows in Stanley. And, and, and we had a van that was, we had no driver, but we had some kids ready to go. And so I just sent out a one call, and, and we had a few ladies in the church um, respond to that and show up. And, and they got in that van, and they drove that van, and, and, and every one for the last couple of weeks they have been driving every Wednesday to pick up kids from Stanley to bring them here so that they can hear about the the love of Christ see that as the love of Christ works deeper in us we do things we never thought we would ever do some of you have, have taken meals over to the Owenses and, and to others in need. And, and it's, it's, a, it's, it's an, I'll use the word inconvenience. It's a bit of a sacrifice. But you know why we do that? Not, not so that we think we're good people, but because the love of Christ has transformed us so much that we want to offer it to other people. It's what's going to happen at the end of the service when we pass the offering plates. There's going to be people who are going to say, you know what, I could keep this money and do something for myself, but I realize that there are greater needs, gospel needs, and I'm going to give what I have toward that. 
sure some of you, 10 years ago, you never would be thinking that you would regularly be giving a portion of your income to a church. And now you do it with joy. That's the love of Christ transforming us. I think we saw it most clearly in these last couple of months as we, have a, as we had a man and who said that the love of Christ has so transformed my life that when God said, I want you to give up your home, I want you to give up your family, I want you to give up your country, I want you to give up your safety, I want you to give up your comforts, and I want you to pack it all up, and I want you to go halfway across the world. That man stood right here a few weeks ago and said, I will joyfully follow the king. <laughs> How does a guy just pick everything up and go halfway across the world? Oh, because the love of Christ transforms us. And if the love of Christ transforms us, and if we're called to love others with that same sacrificial love, why don't we expect the love of our spouses, the love of our parents, the love of our moms and dads and our children, the, the love of our friends, why don't we expect that love that is grounded in Christ to transform us? I think somehow we bought into the idea that love is only about accepting people just the way that they are. Well, if that's true, then Ephesians 5, verses 26 through 28 should say that he accepted the church just the way it was and that for all of eternity, that church would be unholy, spotted, and filled with blemishes because Jesus just loves us the way we are. Well, see, he loves us too much to leave us just the way we are. His love works deeper and deeper and it transforms us so that all of eternity we can enjoy what he desires for us. And so this should help us understand that one of the great purposes of our relationships in our lives, of our marriages, of our families, of our friendships, is that the love of Christ that we have received should be offered to others so that they can be more and more transformed into the image of Christ. Have you ever considered you are God's tool in shaping his children to be more like him? See, one reason we, we struggle with that is because we don't offer covenant love to people. We offer conditional love. I'll love you when you change. But that's not what Christ did for us. He loved us in order to bring change to us. Change that not I want, not, not change for selfish reasons, but change because he's our creator and he knows what will bring us most glory. Oh, and so instead of a covenantal love, so many marriages are filled with, I'll love you if you. But what, what is that on a platform when a, a man and his wife make that covenant vow to one another? It's I will love you in spite of, not I'll love you if. And it's that love that says I'll love you in spite of that begins to change our hearts. Let me briefly try to explain it like this. The, the first time that Jamie and I ever came to, to Page County, um, we got to see the beauty around us, right? It's gorgeous, here, and you all know that. Well, we went back home and told our children what a beautiful place Page County was, and the, the first time we brought our kids here, of course, hoping that they would like it because they would be leaving everything that they known, and, and we thought part of the thing that they would enjoy about Page County would be the Beauty, but the, the day we got here, it was one of those gray, rainy, cloudy days <laughs> to where you don't even see that there's mountains here. And I'm like, oh, Lord, I mean, this looks no different than like most of the country places on the, we pass on the interstate. They're not going to be excited about this at all. God, you got to lift those clouds. Why was I asking him, why was I asking the Lord to lift those clouds? Because I knew what was behind the clouds and I wanted my children to see it. Sure enough, man, Sunday morning, we got 
up to come to church and it was a beautiful sunny day and I remember looking in the rear view mirror watching all three of my kids with their eye with their their face just turned like wow this place is gorgeous do you know that God wants you to see your spouse the way he sees them ma'am he sees your husband as that man who is fully devoted to loving you and your children and engaged in the spiritual discipleship of your home. He wants you to see your husband the way he sees him. And sir, he wants you to see your wife as a woman who is enthralled with the love of the family and, and, and wants you parents to see your children as those who have hearts to honor and obey their parents and see your co-workers as those who worship God with their talents. But you know, the clouds come down. And so all we sometimes see is a husband who never offers help around the house. He just adds to the mess. We see the, the wife who complains about money all the time. And the kids who are just immature and rebellious. And co-workers who are selfish and greedy. And because we see, we don't see the full glory that God has awaiting someone. We only see what our eyes can see right now. That's how we treat them. But God says, no, I, I want you to see what I can see from behind the clouds. I want you to see the, the spouse that I am creating. And it's important for you to see it because you're a part of that process. Your love that is grounded in me is gonna be the transforming power that's gonna help mold them more like Christ. Tim Keller says this about marriage, that marriage is for helping each other to become future glory selves, the new creations that God will eventually make us. I don't know who else said it. I don't know who said this, but someone else mentioned that too, too many people, too many singles, too many spouses, too many parents, too many people were looking for finished marble statues when what we should be looking for is wonderful blocks of marble that contain a masterpiece waiting to be chiseled out. See, we, we want someone else to do the work of preparing the statue when God says no 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 your love through me your love is going to bring a transformation into your home it doesn't mean you don't see the flaws it doesn't mean you don't recognize the flaws but that's where the covenant love comes in I will love you in spite of the flaws I'll love you till death parts us in spite of your flaws because of my commitment to see you become the person God created you to be and I recognize that my love is the tool in God God's hand to shape you into the person he wants you to become but I think so often we like we so desperately want the finished statue we want the finished work that we we withhold our love until that statue forms itself and we say when you become more like what I want I'll give you my love but that doesn't work if your love is meant to be a transforming work, then how does withholding it help? That's the solution. Covenant love does not say, I'll love you when you change to my desires. Covenant love says, with the love of Christ, I will love you in order to bring about the change that Christ <coughs> desires. It's how he changes us. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And these are the changes that the church gets to see from Christ. He didn't wait till we were spotless and holy. He makes us spotless and holy. He didn't wait till we were a finished statue. He took that big, ugly block and he began going to work. And I'll tell you that one of the greatest tools that God has ever used to help me has been that woman sitting right there. Her love has helped me love him more and become more like Christ. Finishing, you'll never 
have this love to offer someone else if you've never experienced this love for yourself. If you're here today and say, man, I would love to offer that kind of love to, to, my, to my spouse or to my family or to my friends, listen, you will not be able to offer the love of Christ to anyone unless you have experienced it for yourself. And if you're here today saying, I don't know this love, oh, it is amazing. That's why, that's, why we, that's why we're so weird as believers. We gather and we sing about someone who lived 2,000 years ago who was killed on a cross. Like, what is that? Oh, that was his love for us. And he's not dead anymore. He went into the ground and he came out because he is the Lord of all. And he is ascended back to heaven and he's sitting on his throne awaiting to come back and rule and reign with his own in a perfect world where we will see one another in our glory selves. Ooh, and that's all the work of him. But if you have experienced the love of Christ, I just want to let you remind you in John 13, 34, if you're one of his disciples, Jesus commanded us to love others, not just. Don't love your neighbor as yourself. No. Love others the way I have loved you, which is with sacrificial covenant love. You say, how do I love people like that? I love it. The Apostle Paul makes it real simple. 1 Corinthians 13. Love is patient. So maybe that's how you show love today. You be patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy, it doesn't boast, it's not arrogant, it's not rude, it doesn't insist on its own way, it's not irritable or resentful, it doesn't rejoice at wrongdoing, it rejoices in the truth, it, it bears all things, it believes all things, it hopes all things, it endures all things. Love never ends. This is what we take and we bring into our homes and we love our spouses and our children and our family. We take it to work and we love people that way. And we allow the change that God has done in us to flow through us so that as we love others, his love changes them too. I don't know what part of this you need, but I needed all of it. Because <laughs> I sometimes want to withhold love until it looks like what I want. When Christ keeps reminding me, now it's your love that is a work that will help transform people into what I see them being one day. Would you pray with me? Oh, our Father, I thank you so much for your word and for the clarity that you offer us. Ah, God, I know that I'm a husband that, that so, so often fails to love my wife the way you loved us. And Lord, I know that there's brokenness inside of this room and there have been failures. Oh, but you are a God of boundless grace. You are a God that doesn't give up on us just because we have faith. You don't look at broken relationships and, and walk away from it. You, you bring restoration in only the way that you can God, you heal. You are a healer of hearts. You are a healer of lives. You are a restorer of dreams. Lord, I know that there are relationships in this room, both marriages, both child and parent, friends and family. Lord, that is being strained. That your love wants to come in and bring a transformation. And Lord, I pray that for those of us who's, who really need you to keep doing that work in us, Lord, I pray that you would not give up, that you would continue to work at molding us more and more into your image. And Lord, we know that that work is not done through a, a hammer just pounding away, but Lord, it's done through a loving, careful, purposeful chipping away at our hardened hearts, at our prideful souls, at our, self, at our own selfishness. And Lord, it is your love that just continues to transform our stony hearts into hearts of flesh. 
may you, may you bring healing in this room. May your love continue to transform us more and more into your image. And Lord, as, as we're about to sing, may we be reminded that it is your goodness ah, that doesn't just come and if we walk away, you, you give up, you turn and go home. No, your goodness, it comes running after. Whew. That's why when you catch up and we let you, <laughs> we allow you, we recognize you for who you are, your, you begin to change us in ways we could never have imagined. Thank you for being such a good God. Would you please work in the relationships in this room, the relationships that would be affected by this church? And may we, be a, may we be a beacon of light and of love to the community in which you have planted us so that they can see the goodness of God running after Page County, Virginia. We love you, but we know our love is only because you first loved us. So thank you for loving